This is Greg Kreitz, narrator of Zombies Ain't Funny, the anthology. And this story is entitled, McGarrigal's Bed, Breakfast, and Smoking Cure Farm. We'll kick your butt so you can kick the butts. And it's written by Jenny Decker. Millicent McGarrigal was having a real fuck -a doodle of a day. In a few hours, she and Godfrey were expecting four new guests at McGarrigal's bed and breakfast. And here she was, 30 miles from home, in the parking lot of the local Social Security office, wrestling Godfrey into his seatbelt. Just settle down. I've got some yum-yum in the cooler, but you'll have to get buckled in first. She pulled the taser from her purse, stepped back, pointed it at his temple squinting her bad eye for better aim, then pulled the trigger. It was all very unseemly in public. Unseemly, but necessary. She needed Godfrey to be seen out and about to further bolster her claim that he was still alive. They'd had a close call once when his left ear fell off while they were standing in the checkout line at Piggly Wiggly. Millicent played it for all it was worth, enjoying the discomfort of townsfolk who would try and mask their horror as her husband regaled anyone in the immediate vicinity with one or more of his new quirks. From the frequent flatulence, coupled with his dank, musty, putrid reek, to the moaning and lurching at passers-by, Godfrey wasn't exactly people-friendly. Millicent got in the car, shoved the cooler into his lap, and turned the key in the ignition. Immediately, Godfrey yanked the lid off the cooler, and shoved his head into the pile of raw cow brains with all the finesse of someone having a grand mal seizure while bobbing for apples. Millicent sighed. Yes, sir, one fuck-a-doodle of a day. She'd just spent 45 minutes doing the same dag-nabbit paperwork she'd been doing monthly since the incident, and still the clerk at the Social Security office wasn't buying what she was selling. For goodness sake, Godfrey was there, alive, standing right in front of them. But, because a death certificate had been filed, Millicent found herself up the proverbial creek without a paddle. Now, she had to prove her husband was alive, even though he looked like the same guy in the picture on his Wisconsin driver's license, albeit with eyes like giblets and skin that had taken on the pallor of a decaying walleye. It's amazing how hard it is to prove someone is alive once a person of authority has signed a death certificate. It didn't matter that Godfrey had gotten up off the table at the morgue, and that five people at Mercy Hospital, in the security video, verified seeing him walk out of the hospital on his own. Now Millicent was spending the winter of her discontent trying to spool back all the red tape, and time was running out. Only three more weeks, and they'd be cutting off his Social Security benefits, unless she could get someone to invalidate the death certificate. Someone, other than the mortician, who'd suffered a myocardial infarction after the body he was in the middle of autopsying, had lurched off the table and ripped the leg from a nearby corpse, gnawing on it like a piece of Colonel's Extra Crispy. Finger licking good. She turned and glared at the shell of her former husband. Godfrey had gotten himself into this mess, and she'd be damned if she'd be forced to live on her own meager SSI check, effectively cutting half her monthly household income, because her idiot retired botanist husband had spent a little bit too much time in the basement gene-splicing rhubarb, mandrake, venus flytrap, and coca plant extract. Oh yes, things had gone horribly, irreversibly awry. From the looks of the notes scattered on the floor where she'd found him, the old lech had been trying to create some kind of newfangled aphrodisiac. Dumbass. Now the man was a walking carbuncle. Outside McGarrigal's bed and breakfast, a few hours later, birds chirped, and weeping willows swayed blissfully in the October air. In the chicken coop, chickens clucked, and two lone cows grazed on grass behind the barn. Inside, Millicent nodded at the man across from her, who was busy chastising his teenaged son, Jimmy. It's a completely unacceptable habit, the father glared at his son. We understand. Millicent handed a cup of tea to each of Jimmy's parents, but when she tried to hand a cup to Jimmy, she noticed the sullen teenager's eyes were riveted on Godfrey, who was having a heck of a time with the zipper on his jeans. 
Millicent immediately pulled the taser out and shot Godfrey in the hand. The family stared in horror as the old man's rigid body shucked and jibed on the couch. Godfrey suffered a stroke a few months ago and hasn't been himself since. Sometimes his heart just needs a little nudge to get the rhythm back on track. As I was saying, we've had a 74% success rate with teenagers this year. That's not bad, Jimmy's mother said without conviction, still focused on the seizing septuagenarian across from her. Millicent scowled at her husband and yanked the electrodes out of his hand. He sat bolt upright, looked around the room, then screamed something that sounded like muskrat. Jimmy's father handed Millicent the first check. I expect results. Here's the 700 for the week. Then he looked down at the second check before reluctantly handing it to Millicent. And the thousand dollar deposit we get back at the end of the week when we come to pick him up. Correct? Absolutely. Unless he violates the smoking rule before then. Millicent tucked the checks into her apron pocket. Jimmy's father turned to address his son. That won't happen, will it? Jimmy. We've confiscated your cigarettes and checked your bag. I'm not losing $1,700 because you have shit for brains. I'll tell you that. Brains? Godfrey screamed. No, no, no brains. Millicent backhanded her husband, then pushed a contract across the coffee table to Jimmy's father. Just sign here. You're leaving me here with this freak show? Godfrey got up and walked to the corner of the room pulled his pants down, and peed into a cat box filled with kitty litter. The father's brow furrowed. Consequences, Jim, consequences. He turned to Millicent. Why is your husband pissing in a litter box? Millicent smiled wanly. Because he doesn't like peeing in the toilet. Any other questions? Jimmy's father sized her up for a moment, then turned to his son. Don't screw this up, son. He led his wife outside to their car as a van pulled into the pebbled driveway. Millicent quickly pulled Godfrey's pants up and shoved him into the den. Be a good boy and go play with your Legos. Later I'll take you outside to visit with the cows, okay? <laughs> Godfrey lumbered awkwardly toward the front door. Millicent loaded another cartridge into the taser and shot just in time. He stiffened and fell onto the window seat, farting loudly. Seriously, this is a joke, right? Jimmy backed into the far corner of the room as Millicent walked outside to greet her new guest. A young man waved enthusiastically, yelling out the window of the van as he pulled away. We're so proud of you, Beth. See you in a week. Beth blew kisses to her husband and sons. I love you guys. But Millicent saw the young woman roll her eyes just before she turned to greet her. You must be Millicent. I spoke to you on the phone. I'm Beth Parker. Yes, dear. Welcome. Come inside and meet Jimmy. He's a bit grumpy, but we'll work on that. Beth looked down at her bag and then back up at Millicent. Don't you need to check my bag in case I'm trying to smuggle in contraband? Oh, no, dear. We go by the honor system here. In the dining room later that night, Millicent sat across from her guests. In addition to Beth and Jimmy, were Stuart and Richard. Stuart had recently received a particularly troubling lung cancer diagnosis, and Richard found himself, grudgingly, at McGarrigal's because the company he worked for was going non-smoking in three months. So, I have all the signed contracts and deposits tidied away. Now let's get down to it, Millicent said. When Jimmy raised his hand, Millicent chuckled. Sweetie, we don't stand on ceremony here. You don't have to raise your hand. What did you need? I was just wondering where your husband is. Jimmy looked around nervously. What's wrong with that guy? Don't worry about him. Millicent patted Jimmy's hand. He's harmless and not contagious, in case you were wondering. He's got a bad heart, a rare skin condition, and has had multiple strokes. Don't bother him, and he won't bother you. Jimmy didn't look convinced. Millicent continued. Now, in the refrigerator, you'll find herbal tea, healthy snacks, and we can also provide vitamin supplements. There is a once-daily exercise routine, and we stick to a schedule for meals and chores here. Keeping busy is the key to success. 
Jimmy looked out the window and watched Godfrey shuffle around from behind the barn, engaged in a slow-speed foot chase with an agitated cow. Monday The next morning, after a hearty breakfast, Sands post-breakfast cigarette, the guests joined Millicent on the yard for an aerobics class. One and a two. Beth lifted her knees, sweating through the high-impact exercise, as the rest of the motley crew clambered along like tumbleweeds at the mercy of blustery winds. Richard repeatedly backed into Jimmy, knocking him on his ass, and Stewart had to break every thirty seconds for a phlegm-induced coughing jag. Behind them, Godfrey rode the lawnmower back and forth over the same patch of grass. After a lunch of hot dogs and potato salad, Millicent began clearing the table. If everyone has had enough, let's get this lunch mess cleaned up and we'll work on arts and crafts. The nicotine-deprived guests let out a collective sigh, garnering a waggling finger and an audible tisk-tisk from Millicent. Save your grumbling for someone who gives a toot. Millicent took it easy on him the first day. After arts and crafts, they sat in a den and took turns reading aloud from the newest Nora Roberts book. Next came some light work outdoors, feeding the chickens, watering the garden, followed by picking and shucking corn on the cob for dinner. By nine o'clock, as their watercolor pictures dried on the front porch, the guests had retired to their bedrooms. Jimmy was snoring. Beth stared at the ceiling in her room. Stuart coughed mightily as he watched Wolf Blitzer do a remote broadcast from China, and Richard paced his room restlessly. Tuesday. At breakfast, Jimmy watched Beth inhale her blueberry muffin and then grab another from the basket in the middle of the table. Stuart swallowed a bite of runny eggs, only to succumb to a deep cough, which ended with a gob of goo sailing through the air and landing with a splat on the floral centerpiece. Richard gagged, pushing his plate away. Dude, why are you bothering to quit smoking? Jimmy asked. You're one step from the crematorium already. An hour later, the group stood next to the barn as Godfrey handed out paint rollers to each one under the watchful gaze of Millicent. Each of you can take a side of the barn. Remember, busy hands help keep the Jones in the way. The guests all looked at one another, but only Jimmy articulated what the rest of the progressively more irritated guests were thinking. So basically, we paid you for the privilege of painting your barn. Quit whining. You're all smoke-free, aren't you? It was a long day, but by the end of it, the entire barn was painted. After dinner, they all headed in different directions. Beth took a bubble bath. Jimmy shoved three pieces of nicotine gum in his mouth before ambling out to the barn to bother the chickens. Richard sat on his bed and sobbed. Stewart, however, had other plans. Once Godfrey and Millicent retired for the evening, he snuck out to his car. After a brief period of time spent rummaging unsuccessfully in the center console, he anxiously tried the glove compartment, finally retrieving a tattered pack of smokes. His pulse quickened, and his breathing became labored, as he scavenged between the seats, finally finding a lighter. He sat up, lit the cigarette, and closed his eyes, taking a long, victorious drag of the mangled Lucky Strike. A knock on the window startled him. His eyes flew open, and he saw Godfrey on the other side of the glass, licking his lips. Stuart took a final drag, then threw his head forward, thumping the steering wheel repeatedly in defeat. Wednesday Jimmy and Beth gobbled huge bites from their syrup-laden stacks of pancakes. Where's Stuart? Richard asked, his plate untouched. Millicent shook her head. I'm afraid he violated the no-smoking rule. Already? Jimmy said with his mouth full of chewed pancakes. Some just don't have the internal fortitude, Millicent said with a sigh. She knew all about internal fortitude. Driving Stewart's car a few miles down the road and leaving it there late last night had left her with a shortage of patience and a severe blister from the long walk home. Thank heavens she watched CSI all the time, because she knew to wear gloves to keep from leaving fingerprints. And God bless her husband for taking his midnight snack up to his room, sparing her the job of cleaning human remains from the faux leather seats. Godfrey's duvet cover, however would be another matter. She'd need to do a better job at keeping tabs on her slowly putrefying husband. At this rate, things were looking dire. If his social security got cut, 
and Millicent couldn't keep Godfrey from eating the guests, they'd be foreclosed on within a few months. As if on cue, her decomposing ball and chain shuffled behind her in his underwear, headed for the refrigerator. Godfrey, I'll serve you in a minute. Upstairs. Godfrey groaned and rubbed his stomach, releasing a long, foul fart, which followed him as he did a U-turn and plodded out of the kitchen. Beth's nose wrinkled when he passed, though the smell didn't dissuade her from licking the syrup from her empty plate before holding it out for another pancake. That's too bad. Stuart had one hell of a cough. Richard and Jimmy shared an amused look as Millicent served her another short stack. Beth dug in. What? I'm hungry. Well, that's fine, hon. But remember, a minute on the lips, a lifetime on the hips, Millicent said. Beth stared at her, stone-faced, as she shoved another forkful in her mouth. She looked around the brightly colored dining room. Ever thought of redecorating? Looks like Martha Stewart barfed up Lady Gaga in here. It's okay, dear. Redirect your frustration. Those nasty cigarettes held you hostage for so long, you don't know what to do when you can't cut off a conversation with the click of a lighter. Later, in the barn, the three remaining guests grew progressively more irritated and were starting to take their frustration out on one another. They'd spent the better part of the afternoon bailing hay and sniping at each other. Beth stopped and fell back into a pile, rubbing her temples. This is bullshit. Jimmy dropped his pitchfork and flopped down next to her. I know. The oldies sure have a racket going on here. Richard turned to them. Quit belly aching, you pussies. You heard what Millicent said. No dinner till we're done. For all of us. Jimmy mocked him in a girly voice. You heard what Millicent said. No dinner till we're done. He turned to Beth and they shared a giggle at Richard's expense. Shut up, you little shit. Richard lunged for Jimmy. Beth rolled out of the way. You shut up, you closeted queer. I'm not a queer, I'm a Republican, Richard bellowed. Yeah, like that's a selling point, Jimmy taunted. Richard threw himself onto the teenager, and an all-out scuffle ensued. Just outside the barn door, Godfrey pulled a long booger from his nose. He stared at his finger for a few seconds before putting it in his mouth and sucking it. When the digit came off in his mouth, he pulled it back out, stared at it, and then popped it back in and chewed it up. Later that night, Beth exited the communal bathroom wrapped in a towel and bumped into Jimmy as he passed. He looked her up and down appreciatively. They exchanged a look, and immediately a silent deal to exchange other things was brokered. It was about an hour later that Richard awakened to sexual noises coming from the room next door. He got out of bed and placed an ear to the wall. At the same time, in Godfrey and Millicent's room, Millicent looked up from her book, hearing the same noises. Godfrey looked from the wall to Millicent. Don't go getting any bright ideas, old man. I don't need your decaying pecker breaking off inside me. How would I explain that to my gynecologist? Godfrey heaved his body on top of hers, knocking her in the face with his now bandaged, four-fingered hand. Millicent Lee deftly pulled her taser from beneath her pillow, and delivered a debilitating shot to the top of his head. <laughs> Godfrey immediately started seizing on top of her, causing their headboard to repeatedly bang against the wall behind them. Get off me, Millicent moaned, struggling to breathe. <laughs> Godfrey moaned rhythmically as he dry-humped her while convulsing. In Beth's room, Jimmy... In the last throes of pre-orgasmic bliss, lost concentration as the sounds of loud banging and moaning came from the other room. Beth pulled a disgusted face and rolled off him. Oh, gross! Jimmy groaned. I'm pretty sure he's mentally retarded. Can retards get it up? Oh, yuck! Beth buried her face in her pillow. Shit! I could smoke the hell out of a cigarette right now. Jimmy threw his head back against the pillow. Beth slowly turned to face him. Really? Really what? Jimmy was frustrated as hell and on the verge of jerking himself to completion right in front of her. Beth quietly got out of bed, pulling the blanket with her. She grabbed her nearby duffel bag and fished out a box of tampons, removing one. One end of tampon wrapper was folded down neatly. She unfolded it, pulled out a cardboard applicator, and retrieved a cigarette that was inside. She pulled another tampon out and tossed it to Jimmy. Seconds later, they stood next to the opened window, taking their first delicious drags. 
until a loud alarm went off, and Godfrey appeared outside the opened window, clad in a stained T-shirt. Unfortunately, he wasn't wearing anything south of his navel, and his Johnson was on red alert. More than a bit of screaming ensued. Thursday Just before sunrise on Thursday morning, Jimmy and Beth exited the house carrying their bags. Two vehicles sat in the driveway. A confused husband stood outside his minivan. An enraged father leaned against his BMW with his arms crossed. What the hell happened, hon? Beth's husband asked. Where'd you get the smokes, Jimmy? Jimmy and Beth exchanged a look. It only took three seconds for Jimmy to fold. He pointed at Beth. She gave it to me. Beth hurried into the passenger side of her minivan, shooting Jimmy a withering look. Beth, her husband asked quietly. When she didn't answer, he said her name again. Beth? Oh, shut up, Stephen. Her husband's eyes narrowed. Well, you can forget Cancun this summer. Jimmy's father shoved him into the back seat of the yuppie abomination. Remember the car you wanted? Savor the memory. Both the ridiculously overpriced car and the sensible van screeched off. And then there was one. Richard groggily stumbled into the dining room. He looked around at the empty chairs and single play setting. Only one fork and plate. Millicent quietly sipped her coffee. What happened to... Millicent shook her head sadly in reply. You're kidding me, Richard said in disbelief. Millicent just cluck-clucked and began to serve him breakfast. Secretly, she was thrilled. She'd managed to keep Godfrey from eating two more guests. They were gone, and she could safely deposit their checks. Three more days, Richard. How are you feeling? Like shit, but I'm not losing my thousand like the rest of those idiots, so don't get your hopes up. Godfrey shuffled into the room wearing nothing but a dazed expression. He lurched toward Richard with his penis in one hand and the television remote in the other. Do you mind? Richard shoved him away. As much as Millicent was growing tired of her festering spouse, she didn't like Richard's attitude toward him. As far as he knew, Godfrey was sick, and sick people should be treated with respect. She decided to make the rest of his stay challenging. For the rest of the day, she had him chop wood and mow the lawn, after which she led him to the barn where she instructed him in the tender art of horse shit removal. For lunch, spam and cucumber sandwiches. For dinner, a cup of soup and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Friday morning, as he ate his clumpy oatmeal, he glared at Millicent across the table the whole time she worked on her crossword puzzle. She pretended not to notice. He spent that day weeding the garden, chopping more wood, and doing her laundry. Though she did take a break and allow him to make origami animals with her for arts and crafts hour. For lunch, chicken nuggets that had been in her freezer for over a year and succumbed to freezer burn, with a side of beets. For dinner, three bean salad, cauliflower, and a frozen burrito. Richard spent more than a few minutes of quality time in the bathroom that night. On Saturday, she increased the aerobic session from 45 minutes to an hour and a half, followed by two hours of him reading aloud from one of her cozy mysteries. Then he did four loads of laundry, mopped the kitchen floor, and ended his day by preparing two chickens for dinner. Preparing, in this case, meant wringing their necks before plucking and cleaning them. It had been a bloody, anguished affair. But Millicent thought it only right to fix him a decent meal on his last night as their guest, Oddly enough, Richard was only able to stomach a few bites of peas before retiring for the night. Sunday On his last day, Millicent handed Richard back his deposit check. Keep up the good work, Richard. And remember, after three days, the nicotine is out of your system, and it's all about breaking the habit. As her final guest loaded his bag into the car, got in and pulled away without so much as a thank you, Millicent pondered her future possibilities. Life with the zombie was a thankless task. What she needed was a better plan. They were down to one cow and two horses, and Godfrey's apparent desire for human flesh was becoming increasingly difficult to manage. It was clear she couldn't continue to invite people into her home while shouldering the burden of protecting them and her income from her ravenous husband. She turned to Godfrey as Richard's car disappeared into the horizon. I suppose we should go get the mail. It was a nice walk, and although it brought her no closer to the answers she sought, at least she'd gotten some fresh air. 
She pulled out the pile of mail and turned back toward the house, shuffling through the stack. Godfrey moaned quietly and shoved a hand down his pants, kneading his decrepit, doughy frontage. Take your hand out of your pants, Millicent groused, ripping one of the envelopes open. <laughs> Godfrey moaned, continuing his frontal assault. Don't be disgusting, Godfrey. Millicent unfolded the letter from Globe Life and began to read. Dear Mrs. McGarrigle, It has come to our attention that Mr. Godfrey McGarrigle has recently passed. Please accept our condolences. Enclosed is the paperwork to expedite payment on the life insurance benefits in the amount of $500,000. Millicent stopped in her tracks. Life insurance? She hadn't purchased any life insurance. She scanned down the letter and noticed that the policy had been taken out ten years ago. Of course, when Godfrey had that skin cancer scare, bless his hypochondriac soul, he must have bought the policy around that time and continued to pay it until... She turned and looked at her moldering husband. A surge of love pulsed through her as she stared at the man in the stained sweatpants and oversized t-shirt, busy jerking his way to zombie town. In the end, he had taken care of her. Unfortunately, she'd done quite a bit of financial damage by lying to keep him alive. Now she'd have to fix it. Richard sat in an intersection a mile from his home, happily tapping the steering wheel as he waited for the red light to change. When the station went to commercial break, he flipped the dial, looking for another song to match his upbeat mood. The Eagles, Take It Easy, came on, and Richard raised the volume, gunning the gas as soon as the light turned green. The driver of the truck, who was supposed to stop at the intersecting road, flew through his red light and nailed the side of Richard's car. Glass broke, tires squealed, and metal whined as the 18-wheeler dragged Richard's compact car an eighth of a mile before sliding to a stop directly in front of the local Denny's restaurant. Breakfast patrons were privy to a front-row seat as the bloodied man crawled out of his upturned car, managed to regain a standing position, only to flop to the cement with a deafening thud, his head exploding on impact like a watermelon dropped from a two-story building. As the driver, who was delivering a truckload of cigarettes to a nearby Piggly Wiggly, jumped out of his barely scratched truck, someone began to scream. The next day, Millicent stood in line at the Social Security office with Godfrey at her side. When it was their turn, she approached the counter. The clerk narrowed her eyes. Weren't you just here a week ago? I told you we can't invalidate the death certificate until you submit the forms to the... Millicent held up a hand to cut her off. She turned to Godfrey and smiled. Go ahead, Godfrey. Show them. Brains. Godfrey lumbered over the counter, bit off the clerk's nose, and swallowed it whole. Within seconds, he'd eaten both ears and one of her pinky fingers. The rest of the office workers and everyone in line stood paralyzed in silence as Godfrey munched on another finger while moaning in ecstasy. Millicent smiled. You were right. He's dead. Not dead dead. Zombie dead. So how do we handle this? A pale employee stepped over the now dismembered body of her co-worker to approach the counter, then turned around to her supervisor, who had just exited his office. Mr. Oligarch, is the form for zombies filed under Z or under FZ01? 